Welcome to Architecting with Google Cloud. I'm developer advocate Kazlyn Fields, and today we're going to explore the architecture of Apollo with engineering lead Adam Zions. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here, Kazlyn. So I know Apollo provides an implementation of GraphQL. Could you first tell us a little bit about what GraphQL is? Definitely. Uh, GraphQL is an API technology that helps developers provide access to all of their data via a graph interface. And QL actually stands for query language. So it's a query language to get at the data graph. And so that differs from the usual kind of hierarchical pattern that REST provides. Um, it's been hugely adopted by a lot of major companies, including Walmart, Expedia, Netflix, Airbnb, on down the line, and originally came out of Facebook to help provide an API to the social graph. That makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like a lot of businesses are finding benefits in this style of querying. Definitely. I think that some of the some of the biggest benefits of are just having all of your data in one place helps to unlock a lot of things. First of all, uh, it cuts down on the amount of redundancy, where if you have all that data there, you're not going to end up recreating the same thing over and over. And second of all, it opens up that data to people who might want to have access to it who aren't just in engineering. People like product management or sales, you want to be able to get into that data, understand how it's you know, being used, who is looking at it to help drive the right kinds of conversations and unlock the most value for that business. Cool. So that's a little bit about what GraphQL is. So now could you tell us a little bit about what Apollo does with GraphQL and what services you offer? Absolutely. Uh, Apollo offers kind of the, the default implementation of GraphQL. So we have an open source client, an open source server, a uh, number of tools besides those that all help people get started with GraphQL uh, and scale it up to production as well. So starting to write out web applications and APIs, move data from REST, or even just start out new projects in GraphQL to prove out the value of it. Beyond those kind of table stakes of how to even get started with GraphQL and build, uh, we, we've invested a lot over the past couple of years in the idea of Apollo Federation, which allows distinct teams to run their own GraphQL services, but then join them together to provide like a single unified graph of all of their data. Um, and so that's also completely free open source Apollo Federation that helps big businesses scale GraphQL within multiple teams. And then we have a SaaS application uh, that helps you, that also has a free version up to you know, paid and enterprise, uh, that helps you understand how your GraphQL schemas are evolving over time, see who is using your graph and how, uh, and help you to kind of automate out that build process and keep those teams in sync without needing to have a lot of Slack communication and email communication that generally happens between back end and front end uh, in order to get that kind of API work done. So GraphQL is an open source API and Apollo offers clients and servers, which are very popular for use both with open source and in businesses. And then you offer all of these additional tools to help make using GraphQL at scale in large businesses a lot easier and kind of make a lot more sense in the enterprise space, like dev tools, query monitoring, this kind of, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but like a, a kind of an auditing tool, it sounds like you were describing. Yeah, yeah. So we are, our mission around GraphQL is to make sure that we provide all of the tools that businesses need to be able to scale and manage their graph in production safely. Awesome. So Apollo provides a lot of tools and services to help developers at these big companies and open source as well, work with data via GraphQL. And you're serving a lot of users and companies. How does a user typically start using Apollo's capabilities? Great question. Typically, users get started or companies get started using GraphQL and using Apollo bit by bit. We very much believe that the idea of re-architecting and starting over from step one via some big like flag day and years of development is not something that anyone is trying to do in 2022. Um, and we highly recommend that when people want to get started with GraphQL, and people want to get started with Apollo, they do that by you know one feature at a time, one application at a time, even you know one page, one component at a time when you're talking about React. Um, and so generally, that's how people get started just as this test case to say, can we take this maybe complicated feature uh, and move it over to a graph? 
Uh, and then once there's success in that, you can incrementally, iteratively start adding more and more into that graph. This sounds like a lot of use cases that I see in the cloud space, especially. Whenever a business is adopting any kind of new technology, it's always best to start with maybe one or two uh, applications that you can start shifting over to that new technology and then shift more and more as you see the benefits and as it makes sense. And as your engineers develop the skills to use those tools too. Definitely. And it, it, it's very similar to, to Kubernetes even, and very much where that idea of Apollo Federation comes from. The idea of being able to move incrementally, be able to segment things off separately, but then bring them together in the end. All of those things are like very prominent in the space of how to do technology right, given all the things that we've learned, um, and very much the direction that we try to come at it as Apollo. Awesome. So a lot of businesses will start maybe shifting something over into GraphQL, start looking at Apollo services, uh, and maybe start moving something over. How does all of this work on Apollo's side and where does Google Cloud fit in? Yeah, so our SaaS application that I talked about before that helps track you know, which schemas are being deployed over which time, that helps you to craft out excellent queries and mutations and sh share them with your friends and colleagues, um, that gives you insights into who is using your graph how. All of that uh, data is hosted inside of Google Cloud. And the services behind the scenes that help make all of that possible is coming from Google Cloud as well. Um, we, we very much believe that our core competency as a business should be building excellent GraphQL tools that help developers build excellent apps and not learning how to manage and run complicated infrastructure. So let's talk a little bit more about this architecture. What are some of the pieces that go into it, both Google Cloud products and other types of technologies that you use to do what you do? Sure. So we're running most of this atop uh, GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. And uh, on top of that, we're using a number of different databases and stores behind the scenes. Um, some of the things that we're running ourselves, for instance, Memcached, Kafka, and an OLAP data source or database called Druid that helps us manage that time series data. Uh, a lot of things we also use Google Cloud for hosting. For instance, Cloud SQL, which we're using Postgres, Bigtable, BigQuery, PubSub, um, Spanner is another really big one that we rely on as well. Um, we also have a couple of services deployed in AWS as well, so that we can have multi-cloud support for the most critical aspects of our system. Um, and I could go into more detail on any of those things, but yeah. I think there's a lot of folks out there who can relate to a lot of those components of architecture. Uh, hybrid cloud, using Kubernetes is, of course, very popular, and I'm a Kubernetes specialist, so of course I would point that out. <laughs> And, but one thing in there that I found really interesting is that you're running your own Kafka. I hear Kafka in a lot of architectures these days. So could you talk a little bit about why you decided to run Kafka yourselves and how that's been going for you? <laughs> yeah. So I, I laugh because it's like, I wouldn't say a sore subject, but I certainly have battle scars. We've been running Kafka over the last few years. And originally when we chose to run our own Kafka, it's because there just wasn't an offering for it on Google Cloud. And there wasn't an offering with GCP via Confluent Cloud either. Um, so we started running our own Kafka then, and we have definitely I think we've reached a point now where things are pretty stable. We're not having, like, knock on wood, but we're not having any kinds of like crazy outages or disturbances because running on Kafka, but we had to learn a lot of things. Uh, I remember a lot of sleepless nights just banging our heads against the proverbial wall, trying to figure out what the heck was going on. In particular, there was this one night where I had to escalate to the CTO at the time who was on sabbatical because the super blocks inside of the disk was actually being completely corrupted because we were going over 16 terabytes, which apparently you can't do on an XT4 file system. Meanwhile, I'm like, I've been using Kafka a few months. I had no idea what was going on. I felt like I learned much more in that one night about Kafka and about disks uh, than I had in the previous month. But that being said, not something I particularly want to repeat. So that's a thing that we're actually looking at right now is how do we migrate to a cloud provider to make sure that now that the world is kind of caught up with our usage of Kafka and there's plenty of options out there, make sure that as we grow out the size of Apollo, we're not going to have to have a Kafka team just to manage uh, that queue. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think a lot of folks out there can relate to having some part of their infrastructure that's just like, we have to run it ourselves because reasons, but it causes a lot of pain. Maybe eventually there are better options and uh, you start considering moving over to one of those newer options so that you can focus more on your core business rather than these uh, pieces that you have to run to make the business work. That's right. And you know, one thing that we've also started to do over the last year or so has been just investing more and more in PubSub. So we haven't added a lot into our Kafka queue. That's mostly just the you know, quote unquote legacy stuff. Um, and we're starting to think about that, that migration after the things that are in Kafka, since they're not super compatible with PubSub at the moment. Cool. So one other thing I want to point out about your architecture is when we were talking about all of this, uh, I found out that you are running pretty much your, your whole business on a single Google Kubernetes engine cluster. And as a Kubernetes specialist, I found this very interesting and exciting. I'd love to hear more about how that's going for you and some of the the tools and kind of tactics that you use to make a single cluster for uh, multiple teams, multiple products even work for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, another great question. Um, and, you know, probably something that will evolve as we grow, like all of our Kubernetes engine and the way that we've built our backend was originally out of one team, as I'm sure it is for a lot of folks who have you know, seen huge growth in their companies. And now we have almost a dozen engineering teams who are planning on doubling that. So I'm sure that a lot of these things are going to change as we scale and grow at Apollo. Um, but ultimately, like being able to have all of this in one GKE cluster has been pretty advantageous. It means that we can wrap all of our kubectl tooling uh, to all work in one way. It means that whenever you're inside of the cluster, you can access logs from multiple different services or do operations on multiple different services without needing to like log in and log out and be like, am I logged into the right one? Um, a couple of things that we have done to make sure that we don't have big problems there is make sure we have separate namespaces uh, to match like production and staging traffic and just um, make sure to keep those separate. And uh, also just having different node pools because not every service is made the same. So we have a bunch of different node pools where we can use taints and tolerations and just like selectors to ensure that those services can be assigned to the correct node pools. Or in you know cases like Kafka, that's just on its own. You don't have like a noisy neighbor problem where like Kafka and some other thing are all on the same pod and one is being starved of resources. I want to point out for anyone that's not familiar with GKE, we have this concept of node pools where a single node pool is all virtual machine instances of the same type, the same kind of hardware configuration, the same pieces there. So then you can use Kubernetes taints and tolerations to manage uh, where your workloads are run, making sure that they're run on the right hardware, the right machines for that workload. That's right. And that's a, you know, I, I say it's all pretty much good. It's kind of a similar story to Kafka. Like we, we have learned our, our hard, we've learned our lessons the hard way. Um, for instance, like we in general are okay with having pods from staging and from production on the same nodes. That's not a huge deal. Um, could be a little scary. For instance, one time we were using local SSDs to store a whole bunch of state, and they were just picked up at the same file path. And we ended up leaking data between staging and production, which had this massive effect on like wiping out a swath of our database. This was like this was years ago, and we didn't affect any customer traffic because of it, but it was the most perplexing issue you could imagine. Um, and so definitely there is a huge advantage in keeping things as separate as possible. And as I mentioned before, like, as we grow out more and more teams, our goal and the way that we think about team management at Apollo is that each team should be able to own its own stack of architecture top to bottom as much as possible and do that independently. So that might mean having you know a different namespace or even entire different cluster per team and being able to join those things together across, you know, some kind of period. Awesome. I think as you grow, like you said, a lot of folks start out with technologies that work when you're one team that's trying to do a thing. And then as you start growing more teams, there are all these types of challenges that you encounter. 
And so you have to start thinking about different ways to do things. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's part of the fun of this. Like I remember starting off in engineering, I had this idea of wanting to do everything perfectly. Um, and as you get in, you're, you know, months in, you're like, okay, it's all about trade-offs. You're not going to do the perfect thing ever. You're going to do the right thing for the right time. And six months from now, that's not going to be the right thing anymore. Nothing lasts. And it's, I don't know, I find that problem really fun and interesting of, balancing all of those different priorities and making good decisions and then you know fixing the airplane as you're in the air so to speak awesome so apollo has a lot of innovation coming up it sounds like as you grow out more teams you're going to consider different ways that you're going to do your uh, kubernetes architecture we talked about kafka possibly moving into a managed service anything else you want to point out about ways that apollo is kind of innovating both on their business and on their infrastructure architecture yeah, um, those are all really good examples. I think that in general, as you grow and scale out the number of teams that you have, there's a lot, like a lot of people talk about scale. And the first thing that usually comes to mind for me is like, you know, what is like the, the TPS that you're trying to deal with? How much more traffic are you getting? But as I've kind of gone through my career, I've started to think much more of scale in terms of people. How many people can you have? actively collaborating on this code base, on this infrastructure. And a ton of work is going to be done over the next several, over the next six months, over the next year, probably ad infinitum to make that more and more achievable. Like we were talking about with trade-offs before. So that means separating this infrastructure so that each team can own its own architecture. That means making it easier to deploy things and have the observability that you want out of the box. That means starting to use more managed services instead of hosting things ourselves. Um, we're also, we are dealing with that other side of scale where we have customers like Walmart and Netflix and Airbnb on down the line. Um, and you know more and more who are starting to adopt GraphQL, who are starting to adopt Apollo and uh, being able to lean in a little bit more to more event-driven systems, making sure that we have partial degradation rather than like complete failures in places, starting to do more chaos engineering. There's a lot of uh, fun things ahead of us infrastructure-wise to make sure that uh, we can hit both of those kinds of scale, both the scale that comes from just the raw growth of traffic as well as the uh, engineers that we're all collaborating with now. Awesome. And speaking of scale and growth, I know that GraphQL is growing in popularity. Of course, Apollo's offerings uh, are therefore getting uh, a boost as well. So I'm sure a lot of folks out there are probably starting to think about GraphQL in their businesses. Maybe they're uh, interested in some of the features and products that you mentioned. Could you tell us uh, where we can find more about Apollo? Absolutely. So the, the best place to start is just our landing page, apollographql.com. We would love for you to check out Studio, that SaaS application. Uh, that's at studio.apollographql.com. If you want to just learn GraphQL and get started, we actually have a course that we're offering, Odyssey, uh, and that's at odyssey.apollographql.com. Um, and last but certainly not least, we are doing a ton of hiring. So if you want to work with us, you can find that careers page on our main website, apollographql.com slash careers. Uh, or just connect with me directly on LinkedIn. Awesome. I love hearing about learning opportunities too. So if you want to check out any of those awesome things that Adam just mentioned, be sure to check out the links in the description below and uh, be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you so much for being on today, Adam, and telling us about your architecture and what Apollo is doing with GraphQL and Google Cloud. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Kaslan. It, it was a real pleasure to be here and get to share that with you. And it, it would be remiss of me to not shout out the excellent people behind the scenes who have built up all of this infrastructure, because I can't claim very much credit myself uh, as I've, I've moved on to the management side of the world. Um, so a really huge shout out to the team that has made all of this possible, that keeps it all running, that is on call, uh, and that is doing all this work to make improvements and come, come join us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Castle.